Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the video I posted last week about my wife and I riding our mountain bikes around Muir State Park for the change of leaves. It was really beautiful. Today we're looking at the book of Revelation again and this time I want to look at how interpretations and the ideas off them can have consequences. When we moved back to the United States after living in England for much of the 1990s, we were confronted by two eschatological realities we didn't expect. The first was Y2K hysteria. I can remember a friend of mine at church pulling me aside and telling me that I needed to purchase a year's worth of food and a gun to protect my family once the world's economic order collapsed with the advent of the year 2000. The second was hype over the Left Behind series. Now there's two questions I want to address today. Why is America so enamored with Revelation? And how has one particular interpretation of the book of Revelation impacted us as a country and beyond? You're watching The Caffeinated Bible and my name is David Paris and today we're taking on a rather deep subject, how Revelation has been interpreted. Now as we go through this, I want to let you know at the very start, I'm not questioning the value or the authority of the book of Revelation. What we are looking at is how it has been interpreted because interpretations can have consequences. Ideas have consequences. And interpretations are ideas and they have consequences as well. And I've written two books about that. Probably the easiest to understand and read is reading the Bible with the giants. Now these ideas have consequences, especially when they concern the future or what we think the future holds. In the 2000 year rich history of biblical interpretation, some readings of the Bible have proven to be very influential and productive for the church and society as a whole. Other interpretations have not been that healthy. This is especially true when we look at the history of how Revelation has been interpreted. I have to roll my cuffs up because the button on this shirt sleeve keeps dinging the table every time I move my arm and the microphone's gonna pick that up. But I digress, again. Let's get back to our topic here. Now America as a nation has a long and steady fascination with the end of time. When it was founded, one of the main meta-narratives of our nation was that America was the city on the hill and that the Millennium Kingdom was beginning to dawn starting in America as a result. This optimistic view really took hold early in our country. A great example of this is the artwork of Edward Hicks, who I think painted over 80 different depictions of what he called the Peaceful Kingdom. In other words, this millennial reign of Christ that was gonna break forth starting in the United States. This optimistic view of the end times began to take a backseat to other views in the 1800s. And the one person we cannot get around is a man by the name of William Miller. Now Miller was a Baptist minister who thought that the text of Daniel 8.14 clearly indicated when the end would come. Daniel 8.14 reads, and he said to me, to 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be put right again. Now Miller believed that one day, an evening and a morning, equaled one year. So Daniel was indicating something 2,300 years later in the future, but from when? He believed that Daniel's countdown started in 457 BC when King Artaxerxes of Persia issued a decree that Jerusalem should be rebuilt. Add 2,300 years to that and settled on 1844 as the definitive date. He wrote, My principles in brief are that Jesus will come again to this earth, cleanse, purify, and take possession of the same with all the saints sometime between March 21st, 1843 and March 21st, 1844. But after March 21st came, it got pushed back to October 22nd, 1844. The non-momentous return of Jesus on October 23rd ushered in what is called the Great Disappointment. It's estimated that Miller had somewhere between 50,000 and a half million followers during his day. 
many of whom sold all of their earthly possessions and went out to hilltops to await the return of Christ on that date. After the great disappointment, many of Miller's followers regrouped in different ways. The Adventist Christian Church was one result of it. It was also the impetus behind the start of the Jehovah's Witnesses. The largest and perhaps best known group that came off Miller's movement is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Ellen G. White's family joined the Millerite movement in 1840 when she was just 12, and her time in this movement had a great and positive impact on her family and her life personally. Ellen White grew up to become a prolific author. She wrote over 5,000 articles and 40 books during her lifetime, which is really quite amazing. Now, Ellen White's eschatology, or the theology of the end times, was based to a large degree on the historicist view that Miller put forward. Now, I have a whole video on the different ways to read Revelation, but basically a historicist view looks back on the history of the church from the time of Jesus until now. It then organizes this history according to seven different periods of time. For example, it uses the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelations 2 and 3 as representative of the seven different historical periods. Almost universally, historicists believe that we are in the last or second to last period of history. For example, Edward Hicks, who did the artwork, really thought we were in this last period of history. Ellen White believed that we were living in the second to last historical period mentioned in Revelation, and that Christ's second coming was imminent, as Miller did. What Miller missed was that there would be some sort of worldwide crisis first, according to White. At the end of a thousand years, Christ would return to the earth to judge the wicked and recreate the earth for eternity. Now, a movement within the Seventh-day Adventist Church interpreted the beast in Revelation 13 as the U.S. government. This movement came to be known as the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas. And I hope you realize here very quickly how ideas can have tragic consequences. It's during this time that John Nelson Darby's Theology of Dispensational is planted into this rich soil of American eschatological expectations. Darby was a curate in the Church of Ireland, and he broke with the church when his archbishop ruled that all Irish converts needed to recognize King George IV as the King of Ireland. Darby's main theological interest was in the nature of the church, from which he started the Brethren Movement and his theology of the church served as the basis from which his theology of the end times sprang, known as dispensationalism. Darby takes the seven eras of history from the historicist movement, but transforms it slightly. The historicist movement looked at the seven historical periods since Jesus till now. Darby took those seven eras and applied them to the history from Adam and Eve until the future. He claimed that there were seven distinct historical dispensations or ages taught in the Bible where God interacted with humanity in different manners. The first dispensation was that of innocence, and that spanned Adam's time under probation prior to the fall of man. The second age was from the fall to the great flood. The third age was from the flood to the Tower of Babel. The fourth was from Abraham to Moses. The fifth was the age of law, from Moses to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And then finally, you have the age of grace, or the age of the church. Then we have the thousand-year millennial kingdom, which will end with God's judgment of the unrighteous and his creating the new heavens and the new earth. And as a result, there's a lot of attention given in dispensational theology to our place in history, right here at this little point in time, right before Christ returns again. As I stated before, Darby's views were not widely accepted in Ireland or England. In the United States, dispensationalism found fertile soil and it spread through two primary sources. The first is Lewis Burry Schaefer, who adopted and followed this approach to Revelation. Now, Schaefer went on to found Dallas Theological Seminary in 1924. 100 years later, Dallas Seminary is still recognized as the center of dispensational theology. 
The second, and what has had an even greater impact, is the Schofield Study Bible that was first printed in 1909. It's hard to overstate the impact that the Schofield Bible has had on the American church. Even to this day, the Study Bible still sells extremely well for Oxford University Press. So why was Darby's dispensational theology and approach accepted in America when it wasn't in other places? There are several reasons for this. The first is World War I, a war that the United States did not want to get involved in, but once it was involved, it reinforced the idea that Christ's return was very near. The Spanish flu that followed on the heels of the soldiers returning from Europe only helped to seal this deal. The second was the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression. These undercut America's confidence in its economic and agricultural prosperity. It really seemed like the apocalyptic time was at hand because of over-farming the prairies in certain ways, we almost had a man-made disaster where the United States lost its breadbasket. The third was Israel's declaration of nationhood after World War II in 1948. Dispensationalists saw this as a divine indication that the end of time was near and an incredible vindication of Darby's interpretation of scripture as well. The expansion of Israel's territory during the Six Day Wars in 1967 only strengthened a dispensational interpretation of Revelation. The crux of dispensational theology really focuses on the end of the age of grace or the age of the church with the rapture where the believers will be taken off the earth. This will then usher in a seven year period known as the tribulation filled with earthquakes, famines, wars, during which the antichrist will come to power. At the end of this seven years, the apocalyptic battle of Armageddon will bring about the defeat of the Antichrist. While this is not the dominant approach to understanding the Bible, even in the United States, it is an incredibly influential view. Fundamentalist, Baptist, and Pentecostal denominations in particular hold to a dispensational view. Some of the better known dispensational teachers are Pat Robertson, Jack Van Impey, J. Vernon McGee, Chuck Swindoll, and perhaps most famously, Hal Lindsey, who wrote The Late Great Planet Earth. Lindsey thought that the rapture would occur in the 1980s. His reading of the Bible led him to believe that Christ would return one generation after Israel was regathered by God, since that occurred in 1948, according to him, and the generation was 40 years, 1988 sounded like the best date possible. Luckily, he was wrong. But this has not stopped the drive to make predictions about when Christ will return. During the 1960s to the 80s, Russia and the communists were seen as prefiguring the rise of the Antichrist, which would then lead to the rapture. With the Iranian Revolution and 9-11, the focus shifted to Khomeini or Ahmadinejad or some other leader within Iran. Now Islam was seen as setting the stage for the final days. Now, one of the strengths of dispensationalism is its ability to recalibrate when one of these threats passes away. Because Israel plays such a vital role in dispensational theology, dispensational teachers have had a keen interest in developments in the Middle East. The reconstitution of Israel and the rebuilding of a temple in Jerusalem play a central role in their eschatological framework. According to Darby and successive dispensational teachers, the land of Israel must be restored to the Jewish people. And by this, they are usually referring to the national boundaries under King David or Solomon. Even though you have the West Bank and the Gaza Strip inhabited by the Palestinians, Israel needs to be extended into these regions as well. Jerusalem must become the city of David again. So any sort of solution that involves a Palestinian East Jerusalem and a Jewish West Jerusalem is simply untenable and the temple must be rebuilt and the sacrificial system reinstated. The problem is there's a mosque on the Temple Mount right now. Almost everything is riding on the Jewish people and this view of the Holy Land according to dispensational view. As a result, many dispensationalist leaders provide financial and lobbying support to Jewish groups like the Temple Movement that seeks to reclaim the Temple Mount and build the temple on it and start the sacrificial system over again. But dispensational is not all good news for the people of Israel. 
According to Darby's views, only Jews who convert to Christianity will be spared eternal judgment with the rest of the world. So these very right-wing Jewish leaders that want to retake the temple and the entire land of Israel really appreciate the support that these American pastors and church leaders are giving them. At the same time, it's a tough pill for these Jewish leaders to swallow because they are very aware of these dispensational pastors and their views upon the eternal destiny of these Jewish believers. This is where ideas or interpretations have consequences. And I'm going to hit three of them in regard to dispensational theology. Number one, because so much rides on the Jewish people being in the land, rebuilding the temple and resuming the sacrificial system, dispensational leaders have taken a keen interest and involvement in affairs of the Middle East. For example, Pat Robertson is a firm dispensational television evangelist. When Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon suffered a massive stroke in 2006, Pat Robertson taught that Sharon's stroke was divine punishment for his pulling Israeli settlements out of the Gaza territory. Robertson felt that Sharon was interfering with God's plan to restore the Davidic kingdom boundaries to the nation of Israel. This has led to a marriage between dispensational beliefs and support of the right-wing Israeli policies, including settlements, the treatment of Palestinians, including Christian Palestinians, and Jerusalem being a Jewish city. This has led to their support and lobbying efforts of Republican politicians for policies that will advance their interpretations of biblical prophecies. This is definitely an example where religion inflames politics and politics inflames religion. Consequence number two. Another area where this dispensational view has consequences is regarding environmental matters. Environmental challenges like climate change are not only ignored, they're often seen as an indication of the coming end times. Human well-being is on a downward spiral according to dispensational theology. This will only be reversed by Christ's intervention in history with the rapture and then the final judgment. The devastation of climate change is viewed as either part of the plagues, famines, and earthquakes that will precede Christ's return, or climate change is downplayed. No need to worry about it because we will be raptured and Christ will recreate the earth. I've actually heard one evangelical leader say, you know why climate change is not real? because God will restore the earth. So no need to worry about it because we won't be here when it gets bad. And then when Christ returns, he's gonna clean it all up for us. Others believe that efforts to confront climate change are all part of this underground network of global forces, such as the Illuminati, that are laying the groundwork for the Antichrist to come. Consequence number three. Dispensational projections about the future have often been co-opted by a Republican agenda. For example, Tim LaHaye, the author of the Left Behind series, helped found the Moral Majority, the Council for National Policy. He supported and worked with Reagan, Jack Kemp, Mike Huckabee, and George Bush on their presidential bids. It is not so much just a dispensational view of the future based on how he reads the book of Revelation, but Equally, it is mixed what used to be Republican values. Having said that, I want to go back and repeat what I said at the start. I am not questioning the value or the authority of a book like Revelation. What I've tried to show in this video is that the method we use for interpreting the Bible has consequences. In this case, the ramifications are pretty serious. Second, just because a person does not hold to a dispensational view does not mean that they don't hold a warm spot for Israel. The biblical stories all revolve around and occur in the land of Israel. And finally, when we are interpreting books like Revelation, which the church has wrestled with for over 2,000 years, I think it's a bit presumptuous on our part to say that these texts were written specifically for our little pinpoint in time, especially when that time keeps getting revised and changed you would have thought we would have learned the lesson from the Millerites in the 1800s. Dispensationalism is one method of interpretation to read Revelation and other apocalyptic books in the Bible, and it helps to be familiar with what the other views are and how they read this book as well. 
Now, if this subject interests you and you want to learn more or irritates you, you want to find out where these ideas are coming from, let me give you three books that you can pick up or you can ask your library to get in and they can read it. And I will have links to them in the show more section underneath the video. The first is the Schofield Bible, its history and impact on the evangelical church by Todd Magnum and Mark Sweetnam. The second is Apocalyptic Fever, End Time Prophecies in Modern America by Richard G. Ryle. And then finally, a book by Tim Weber, who used to teach with us here at Fuller Seminary when we had a campus in Colorado Springs, On the Road to Armageddon, How Evangelicals Became Israel's Best Friend. All three of these are good. If I was going to pick one, I would probably pick the one by Tim Weber, On the Road to Armageddon. I hope you found this video helpful and useful and it didn't alienate you. Remember, we're talking about an interpretive method, not the book of Revelation itself or the nation of Israel or the Jewish people or anything like that. We're just talking about one method that was developed by Darby in the late 1800s that found fertile ground in the United States. If you find these videos useful and perhaps provocative, please subscribe. That helps me to grow the channel. Also, give it a thumbs up and let your friends know about it. Hit that share button and let other people know about it. That's the best way I know to help this channel grow. Now, that's important because then YouTube will recommend these videos to other people when they search for something like Revelation or Biblical Interpretation. So, thank you very much. Until next week, I will leave you with the word of peace.